Well, this is a book which doesn't really fit traditional conventional notions of what a history book is about. Um, because it's, 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 a, it, it's the kind of um, publication which is, I think, better described as a, as a second order work. That's to say, its focus is not on actual history, but on how we should interpret history, uh, how we should understand the work that historians do, why they do it, how they do it, and with what sort of outcomes they do it. Now that doesn't mean that there is no history in a conventional sense in the book at all. It's there in a multiplicity of historical episodes and incidents which serve to illustrate the general drift of the argument. Um, but, the, but the function of the book is to explore certain ways of thinking about history as a, as a particular academic pursuit. That's why it's called the pursuit of history. Um, and what it offers to students in particular is a sequence that starts with the basic definitions of what history is about and what it means to be historical through to some of the most up-to-date um, forms of scholarship. And what it tries to do throughout that discussion is to adopt, I was going to say a critical stance, which might suggest that I'm rejecting things. It's, mu it's much more a matter of, of being open to different ways of understanding, interpreting, and evaluating what the book has to say about the, the nature of history. One other thing to say about it is that you might expect it to be a comprehensive guide to history. Such a book, if it were to be composed, would be um, huge. Um, and, in, and, and it would be really mistaken to think that a, a textbook in particular should try to be comprehensive. What it does do is to give a flavor and give a sense of, of a number of contrasted ways of doing history and thinking about history. And in that sense, should preserve your interest. This is an interesting question because it hinges on the word relevant, which for a lot of historians is actually quite a red rag to a bull. Over the years, I've become more and more convinced of the importance of acknowledging history's potential relevance and exploring the ways in which history can tell us something about the world that we live in today. Um, The point to stress about any claims to relevance is that they are contingent. That's to say they are dependent on where we stand today. Relevance changes. It changes according to the progression of what's happening in our society and in our politics. Now, clearly in the pursuit of history, um, you would expect the most recent additions to the book over, over successive editions uh, to be most obviously relevant. So if we take themes that we move on to in the second half of the book, uh, like uh, gender, uh, like post-colonial perspectives on history, there we're looking at approaches to history which were scarcely on the horizon when I first wrote the book um, back in the 1980s. Um, but of course, there are other things which uh, remain the same, uh, even though the claims to relevance may be shifting. And the things that stay the same are the fundamental ways in which we, we, which we define what history is. I actually start the book with a chapter called Historical Awareness. Um, and the point of that chapter is to show that there are ways of thinking about the past which are not historical. For example, pursuing a, a very nostalgic notion about the past and how it can um, entertain us. That's likely uh, not to be consistent with the kinds of historical awareness that historians value, which are to do with getting to grips with as close as we can get to the reality of the past, of the past however messy it may be and however uh, repellent it, it, it may be. Um, so starting from the, those first two chapters in the book, there's a, the, there's a sense which I try to convey that what historians do does actually have its links to quite a remote past. That's to say back certainly to the mid 19th century when the essentials of our discipline were laid out. But how we use those essentials and how we interpret them 
That's what's changed and what's become more relevant in the last few decades. One thing I can say is that when I first set out to write this book, there was very little competition. And what I mean by that is that the idea that it should be uh, uh, expected and even mandatory for students to study the nature of the discipline in this second order fashion that I described a moment ago, that had hardly taken off uh, uh, at all. And I was very conscious of writing a book for a particular college that I was teaching in, which was, which was in a way, um, casting out into unknown waters in, in thinking that history should be presented in this way. So that, so that students in those early days, and that includes myself as a student, um, received no guidance and no tuition at all um, on the kind of topics which are covered in the pursuit of history. Um, so it's not, it's not just that the book has changed, the author has changed. It's the same author, but the author in the course of these, of, of these several decades has changed his, my approach to the subject. If I tell you that I, I began, that my, my um, academic specialism when I first wrote this book uh, was African history, largely of a political and economic nature. And that in the last 30 years, my, my uh, home discipline as it were has been quite different. It's been the history of gender and specifically masculinity in, in British history. Um, and of course, those, those changes in my own perspective are inevitably uh, reflected um, in the book, not in the sense of, of giving a kind of partisan advocacy of a particular new approach, but to, but to lay out the assumptions and the values and the objectives that lie behind some of those um, new forms of history. Um, the other thing is that, and again, this reflects the way in which I've evolved and changed as a historian. I mentioned a moment ago the changing significance of being relevant. And one of the ways in which I've taken that up is to think more systematically and methodically about how historians can communicate their knowledge to a much wider audience, which I hope this book will, 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 will assist, um, to, to write about history, to present history in ways which are genuinely illuminating for a wider audience, not, not just in terms of entertainment, though goodness knows history can be very entertaining, but in terms of actually um, facilitating a greater critical understanding of, of, the, of the world we live in and how it might be understood um, more accurately. Well, I suppose the most obvious way in which I would expect instructors to use this book is as a textbook, which would be an accompaniment for classes over a, a module, over a course, um, where, where, where history students are, are being, as it were, introduced to this way of thinking about history, in, in which case it would probably make sense to take a, a chapter of the textbook week by week and to supplement it with other readings. Um, but I have two other um, suggestions to make, which, which might be worth considering. One is that it would be very illuminating to compare the seventh edition of the Pursuit of History with the first edition as a way of documenting the ways in which the practice of history, the practice of history by historians has actually changed during those 30 or 40 years. Um, and uh, it, would, uh, it would tell us quite a lot about the ways in which we think history has become more effective, more stimulating, or possibly the ways in which we are doubtful about that, but to actually make that comparison would be of great interest. The other suggestion I would make also concerns my own work, and that is a companion volume with Pursuit of History called Historians on History, which is an edited collection of quite substantial passages from about 30 or 40 historians that, effect, that were chosen really to illustrate the main forms of history that I discuss in the Pursuit of History. So it's an ideal companion because it fleshes out uh, the points that are being made in the pursuit of history by, by as it were, allowing uh, historians, and in many cases, really quite distinguished historians, to elaborate on the point themselves. This book uh, 
will certainly be referred to by a lot of people as a textbook. And that's a slightly dangerous label. It can be a total kiss of death, partly because it suggests to the user, to the reader, that somehow this is kind of wholly rich, you know, that this is actually the, 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 the essence of what the, what the subject matter is, is and the way it's written down and presented here. Um, and therefore leads to a, a rather mechanical reading um, and a, a reluctance to be a call at all critical. And one of the things that I hope from this book is the way it's actually written will um, constantly prompt the reader to think, hang on, is, is, that, is that my view? Is that view properly sustained by the evidence? Is it well argued? It's those sorts of critical questions that I think ought to be at the forefront of, um, uh, of, of the reader's approach. And as, as part of that critical approach, it would be worth, I think, thinking to yourself, are there parts of this book that I have serious doubts about? And you have the freedom to pose that question. It's not a kind of subversive question. It's one that any, any reader ought to pose to a book of this kind. And just to, to instance one area of the book where you might have that view, you might say, why is there a substantial half chapter on Marxism, for God's sake? You know, this is a passe ideology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can understand how that might be um, rejected. But the point that I'm making in the book is that the historical um, uh, assumptions which underpinned Marx's own work, much of which was historical, are assumptions which, are, which have, have continued to influence the way that historians write today. In particular, the notion of seeing any historical society as a totality with, with economic, political, social, and cultural dimensions, which ultimately have to be understood as cohering, as belonging together. And Marx is one of the main intellectual resources that enables uh, us to do that. So I just give that as an instance of how one should, one should never let one's critical guard go down. <laughs>